Okay, welcome back. Disappointingly, this is our last session of the day. Um, I know we probably all want to go into the evening and have a couple of uh, virtual beers and do a couple more, but we've got to come to a close. Um, at the end of this as well, we will also be moving in to uh, probably a short break. Um, and then after that, please do stay around for the closing remarks from Ian, uh, Ian Glover, the president of Crest as well. Um, but for now then, uh, as I said, we are moving on to our last presentation. Uh, he joins us uh, from the US. He is the uh, cyber threat intelligence and digital forensics expert here, uh, sorry, there at Home Depot. And he is going to be talking about the threat lurking within the shadows. Hello, CrestCon UK, and welcome to my presentation, The Threat Lurking in the Shadows, Uncovering Your Ransomware Susceptibility. Today, I will be your presenter. My name is Robert Moody. Uh, I hold several industry standard certifications, but let's dive right in. Agenda. So what will we talk about today? Today, we will be provided a disclaimer, which is something I have to do. We'll, do. we'll cover that really quickly. We'll talk a little bit about the ransomware scourge, what all industries are facing today. We'll get a little bit of an understanding of how you can view your own threat landscape then use that to reflect inward. Where are you vulnerable? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about vulnerability analysis, understanding your risk, and then building a plan to fix your risk. And then at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. Disclaimer, all contents contained in this presentation are solely the views of the presenter and do not re represent the opinions, beliefs, experiences, policy, or operating agreements of any organization a speaker currently works for or has worked for in the past. Uh, I'm a threat intelligence and digital forensics or incident response expert. I currently lead a threat intelligence team for a Fortune 20 organization. Uh, done a lot of threat hunting in my time working for the past decade in cybersecurity. Uh, extensive experience working with the legal community, private sector, and on large scale international or multinational projects. My background includes experience in telecommunication, consulting, retail, financial services, uh, as well as a few other industries. So let's talk about the ransomware scourge. It's it constantly in the news. Uh, one caveat of this presentation, the focus and the remediation and recommendations I'll provide are really focused around the vulnerabilities that ransomware gangs or these organized crime groups that um, distribute ransomware focus on and look to attack an organization by exploiting these vulnerabilities. So a little bit about the scourge. Uh, Purple Security, which is a, it's a vendor, published an amazing white paper on their website. It put out some really interesting statistics for 2019, 2020, and some predictions for 2021. But let's look back to 2020. Uh, it was a rough year for everyone, except for the ransomware gangs. There was about 20 billion in estimated cost of ransomware attacks. 90% of all financial institutions have experienced ransomware in the past year. That's terrifying. 95% of ransomware profits went through cryptocurrency trading platform BTCE. Bitcoin is still among uh, the cryptocurrencies that ransomware gangs like to be paid in. Uh, there's about $8,100, uh, this is all in USD, uh, cost of a ransomware per incident. That's expensive when you start looking at the small and medium-sized companies that are affected by ransomware. And this is just one incident. And once you're a victim once, these gangs look at you as a potential source of income and will attack you again. So there's six stories here, all high profile news. There's many more. If you have Intel sources, I'm sure you get a uh, daily ransomware update, but calling out some of the more high profile attacks in 2021, uh, Colonial Pipeline here in the US where I'm based out of, this was big news. This impacted the price of gas. So it's breaking that cyber physical plane that we've often talked about and in the industry, but it's really a problem. This organization paid 5 million in ransomware demand. Uh, then you have a data which suffered 700 gigabytes of data stolen by the Ragnar Locker ransomware. They're also known as Viking Spider. This is scary just from the sheer volume of information that was exfiltrated in this attack. Fujifilm, another one, business disrupted due to a ransomware attack. 
University of Florida, my alma mater, uh, their hospitals were set back to pen and paper due to a ransomware attack. Uh, you can even look back into 2020 and talk about Garmin. Uh, so we've talked about oil and gas, uh, a technology company that provides cloud services, uh, the producer of cameras, a hospital, a smartware company, and now JBS Foods, which is the manufacturer of meat and quite a lot other uh, products. This is not industry specific. This uh, these attacks are prolific and prevalent. The only call out is this has been a problem in the industry for a long time. It's just receiving the news that it deserves and high profile companies are being affected. But it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, you can understand your threat landscape to look inward and then understand how to fix the issues that underlie your technology, uh, remediate vulnerabilities. But we'll go through this a little bit more in depth in a second. So understanding your threat landscape. If you're part of a threat intel team or work closely with your threat intel team, you'll understand they look at uh, your threat landscape from an adversarial intent and capability stamp. So making a couple buckets here about adversarial intent. So you look at it from attacks on your organizations. This is the highest amount of intent in a cyber crime group or an organized crime group, cyber adversary, whatever term you want to use has. If they're going for you directly, you know the intent is at its highest. If they're attacking your competitors. That's a good sign that you may be next or you need to start taking action to prevent yourself from being next. Higher adversarial intent than those that attack your industry or opportunistic attacks, but less than that of those that attack your organization. So pulling that out to that attacking of your industry. So if you know that they're attacking your industry, but it's not your competitors yet, and it's not yourself, there's a little bit lower intent. And then opportunistic attackers. They're financially motivated, especially in the ransomware space. They're looking to make a profit. Uh, they're going for anybody they can. They often use spray and pray tactics, which is a fancy way of saying phishing emails with uh, ransomware, either downloaders or uh, ransomware attachments embedded in the, into it. Uh, good cyber hygiene will help prevent this from being a problem. So then you look at that second part that I mentioned, the capabilities. So you look at what type of funding do these organizations have? Are they aligned with government interests? Which means they would have more funding. Are they very successful in what they do? And they have a lot of profit to reinvest themselves. Like any good cybersecurity practice, you apply learning, knowledge, competence, you build your skills, you train your people, you grow them, you increase their ability, and you have experienced leaders. Cybercrime is the same way. These organized crime groups operate reminiscent to the um, Italian mafia in a sense. They have specific people who are very skilled at what they're doing and use that expertise to build out uh, in-house capabilities. So if there's a lot of funding and the capabilities are maintained and improved, there's a high capability of the adversary. So let's extract that out. Here's a sample threat landscape. If you're looking at it from this perspective, this is an analysis I would recommend uh, any Intel team do. So you look at it, you understand based off of the adversary's capability and intent, you score them. So in this scenario, we're seeing that Wizard Spider who deploys the Conti ransomware and Pinchy Spider, Rev, which deploys the Rev Evil ransomware, Doppel Spider, which it deploys its namesake, the Doppel Pamer ransomware, and Carbon Spider are all of high interest. You keep going down the list. Uh, you have Graceful Spider, which deploys Clop, then Traveling Spider, Nephilim, uh, Viking Spider, which is Ragnar Locker, Wizard Spider, which is Ryuk, and then you get to the moderate. So less, less high of a threat, maybe that's due to adversary intent or capability, but for the purpose of this example and sample threat landscape, it's due to their intent in this sample organization. So the Cuba ransomware gang and the SIA ransomware gang do not quite have the same intent to attack the organization, so they have a moderate threat. This is great, this is good to know, it's all theoretical though, how do you know how you could be impacted or affected or attacked by these groups? You need to reflect inward. You reflect inward by looking at how these groups operate. As you've deemed or your Intel team has deemed that Wizard Spider, who deploys the Conti ransomware, is of the highest interest or critical threat to your organization, you look at them from the vulnerability perspective. You say, okay, 
I know that Conti is a threat for us. I know that they utilize uh, the following CVEs or vulnerability numbers to attack us. And then we look at ourselves to say, okay, we have Pulse Secure, we have, uh, we have Citrix, we have Microsoft, we have systems that employ Microsoft Server Message Block 3.1, uh, we have net log on and you start going through the vulnerabilities to see, do we have this? Do we not have this? But this is a very complicated exercise if you're part of a large organization. You need to look at it from the perspective of working and collaborating with other security teams. Intel can't do it alone. One of my favorite quotes that I've ever heard in terms of security and the way to operate with others in the cybersecurity, the cybersecurity is a team sport. And personally, I take that to heart. That's what I tell my teams. You really need your partners to help you be able to defend against the bad guys because they're playing together to attack us. We need to do the same. So how do you do this? You take these CVEs or vulnerability numbers and you look what's in your environment. Do we have these? Yes, no, maybe. And you really deep dive into it. But this is where you have to leverage your vulnerability management team if that's the function within your organization. So to do this, you perform vulnerability scans. Uh, some of the major players in this space are Rapid7 Nexpos, Qualys, um, Tenable's Nessus. So you really look into it and say, okay, vulnerability team, please help me perform a scan for the CVEs that I've identified. I need to know if these technologies exist in our environment. Are they at an affected version? And that's important to understand and really pull into the idea that, am I susceptible to these attacks? Do... A, does a ransomware gang or cyber adversary have a means to enter my organization? The vulnerability management team could also provide you information around uh, what type of compensating controls exist, and they can deep dive you into some very interesting analysis we'll get to in just one moment. So after your vulnerability management team has performed the vulnerability scans, you can get something like this. Uh, again, the numbers here are arbitrary. This wasn't an actual assessment but this is meant to make a point. Uh, you look at a large scale organization, you can have historical vulnerabilities, not just from 2019, 2020 and 2021, but you look at it and say, how many assets do I have in my organization that are affected by these specific vulnerabilities? Because you know they're being used in the wild by these groups and to identify these vulnerabilities, backtracking a little bit, your Intel team can rely on both open source and closed source intelligence to absorb to observe and to, to hunt for mentions of these groups utilizing these vulnerabilities and exploiting them to perform an attack that results in something like we saw from all the news articles. So breaking this out a little bit further, uh, there's, this is where intelligence comes back into play. So you have your total asset count. You're probably working with a senior stakeholder if you're doing this type of vulnerability analysis and assessment. You want to understand where in your organization these vulnerabilities lie. This may be an intelligence requirement that's put on to you and your team from the senior leadership. So using the results from the vulnerability management team, your senior leader could say, Intel team, can you explain this to me and break out where by location, and each organization is different, their ecosystem is, could be more complex or less complex, but using this example and this hypothetical scenario, uh, this organization that we're looking at with these affected assets by these CVEs has two types of locations. It's either the corporate network or satellite offices. Okay, so we can work with that. So of the total assets that are affected, how many sit within the corporate network? For C, let's use the first one as an example. CVE 2019-11510, the one that was going after the Pulse Secure. Uh, this one is focused in on 3,756 assets being affected in your corporate network and 1,844 in your satellite office. In this scenario, the executive could come back to you and say, okay, we're very focused on the corporate network. That's where our corporate secrets or our uh, crown jewels lie. We're worried about customer data being there. If you're in healthcare, you're worried about HIPAA data. If you're in Europe uh, continent, you're worried about GDPR. There's a lot of higher level strategic concerns that need to be um, met through this analysis. You need to understand what type of data exists in these locations on these affected assets so you can really start to build an understanding of the impact if you were to be attacked 
and also the risk that your organization is carrying by having these vulnerable systems. So that was a lot. So let's deep dive even a little bit further to get to that level of understanding and to answer the question that your senior sponsor has provided. So he or she may tell you the corporate network is of interest. Let's look at that, let's focus on that. And of the affected assets, I'm interested in this threshold. So let's say over a thousand assets affected and that are of PII or personally identifiable information importance. So using that specific criteria or that specific intelligence requirement, you can look at it and say, uh, CVE 2019-11510 is of serious concern because of the corporate assets that are affected where our crown jewels and our customer data sits, there are 2,123 assets that have PII information. This should absolutely scare whomever you share this information with. And there's variations of this. If you work in the retail space, you can be worried about something like PCI DSS. Uh, again, being in the hospital space, you can be worried about HIPAA if you're in the US. There's a lot of different ways to spin this and different questions come will come from different execs. But this type of deep dive analysis can give you an understanding of the true impact that you could feel if you were hit and your organization was locked down by a ransomware game. So building a plan. So breaking this out, you look back and, and you say, okay, the input's into my plan. I need to know who's most likely to attack us. You go to your Intel team, you work off of that really nice uh, heat map or threat mapping. I recommend the MITRE ATT&CK framework to help reflect that out at a, at a technical level. But once you get an understanding of who's attacking you, you look at how they're most likely to attack you. From the perspective of this presentation, we're looking at, a at it from a vulnerability level. So the attackers were worried about ransomware gangs defined. Okay, we know the ransomware gangs who, have the who are deemed most critical because of adversary intent and capability will then look at it and say, okay, uh, we know these CVEs exist in their attack chain or how they go about attacking an organization. We will then look at the vulnerability scans and vulnerability data that our teams collaborate with to produce. And we know that these are the number of assets affected. And then we know where they're most likely to attack us based off of where the affected assets sit. This is all getting us to building the plan. So to build a good plan, you need to understand how to close the doors and how to appropriately align your strategic initiatives to what you're seeing in your threat landscape. As it pertains to ransomware, you would look at, okay, how do I deploy resources to ensure that patching occurs? We wanna make sure that all of the critical gangs um, are, have their CVEs patched. From there, you also look at the perspective of what's your risk tolerance. I recommend a risk tolerance of zero when it comes to ransomware. I think that uh, any organization should be definitely concerned with this and prioritize this in terms of response and strategy. And I don't believe I would get much pushback on that. So you start to close up the gaps that you have as an organization through patching, through uh, deployment of workarounds, and you make sure that your organization does not have those holes and opens. And then you look at where were these vulnerabilities sitting within your organization? Which departments were most likely to be hit? Which, which groups were carrying the most risk, either intentionally or unintentionally? And you look to provide uh, either basic cyber hygiene recommendations, such as deploying, uh, let's say, email filtering protocols, you look at it from the perspective that your security teams need to be increased in these locations. You need to bring in new log sources and you start to build out how you can go about it at a tactical or operational level. To, and then as a funding level as well, do I need to procure new tools to detect future attacks? Does the Intel team need more resources? Are there feeds or sources that I can procure to help make our analysis more robust? Were there any gaps in our scanning? Do we have locations that aren't included in this and we need to look into it? So there's a lot of steps you can take to build out your plan and shore up your defenses to ensure that uh, these types of attacks aren't going to affect you and you won't be the target of a future attack. It's an industry-wide problem and you need to take proactive steps to remediate these.
these concerns. Uh, this is where we would go to a Q&A session. So if you have any questions with anything covered so far, um, please put them into the chat. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, thank you. And my parting words are cybersecurity is a team sport. We need to work together to stop these ransomware gangs. Uh, it's not going anywhere. There's financial profit to be made, and this is just going to continue. It's been a problem. It will continue to be a problem, and it's on us to fix it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the astute amongst you, uh, the high quality threat intelligence uh, practitioners would have realized that was a pre-recorded session. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Moody cannot be with us this afternoon. He's uh, in the US and he's dealing with something. So um, that's going to bring it to a, a close.